Chapter 11 The Bottom of the World You can't keep her locked up, I said to Hal. I don't want her sneaking about my ship. She could get into the wireless room and radio our position. She could tamper with our engines. She stays in there till we return to Paris. Hear, hear, chimed in Miss Simpkins. We were back in the lounge, all of us except Nadira. Kate looked paler than usual, but no longer green. At the table, Jangu Sherpa was busy with his tools, trying to open the brass casing of the transmitter. It had no screw holes, nor any seam, nor hinge I could discern. The transmitter was in my bag, not hers, I said. Doesn't that prove she's got nothing to do with Wrath? Or else why wasn't she carrying it herself? She may not be working with Wrath, but she's already deceived us, and I don't mean to be deceived again. She knew if she told us about Spearglass, you wouldn't let her aboard. With good reason. If Spearglass gave her that key, others might know about it. Who's to say she hasn't made her own murky alliances? We're less than a day away from the Hyperion. We find her, and Nadira might have a crew of rascals ready to snatch the ship from us. For all I know, she's already radioed them to coordinates. You're assuming the very worst about her, I said. What about the rest of us? Why not lock me up? It was in my bag. It did occur to me. And just to be safe, I added, better lock up Kate and Miss Simpkins too. We might all be in it together. I resent that, Miss Simpkins protested. I'm just trying to be fair, I said. You're very outspoken in her defense, Kate said, staring hard at me. My heart sank. Of all the people at the table, I'd expected her at least to be my ally. I knew she held no prejudices against gypsies, but right now I could not fathom her. Let us not forget Nadira is the daughter of a notorious pirate, Miss Simpkins said. What's that got to do with anything? Don't be naive, Cruz, said Hal. It indicates very poor breeding, Miss Simpkins informed me primly. We're not dogs or horses, I insisted hotly. None of us gets to choose how we're born. It's what we make of ourselves afterward. Hal looked thoroughly unimpressed. I glanced at Kate. She turned her eyes away from me, and I felt as though I'd been slapped. She's a pirate's daughter, Hal said. She's had ample opportunity to be influenced, corrupted, and ensnared in all sorts of nasty enterprises. But we have no proof she's engaged in anything unsavory, I insisted. Matt's right. Kate said. I looked at her, grateful, but her gaze was on Hal. I think she just wants her fair share of the Hyperion's cargo, Kate went on. She means to start a better life for herself. I like her. You do? I said, surprised. Very much. She's got good spirit. You killed her father, Hal said to me. If I were you, I'd wonder if she had a knife destined for my throat. Nadira had climbed the crow's nest early this morning to see me. If she'd wanted, she easily could have slipped my throat. I had been completely unsuspecting. Instead, she had kissed me, the daughter of the man who tried to end my life. I made my brain go over it one more time just to make sure I understood. I had kissed Vikram Spearglass's daughter. I don't think she means to kill me. I said. Unlikely, Kate agreed. I remembered how intently Nadira had questioned me about my so-called duel to the finish with Spearglass. She'd wanted to know every detail, every thrust and parry. Maybe, once I admitted Spearglass had not died by my hand, whatever anger she'd felt for me had evaporated. There was a sharp crack as Jang Bu succeeded in splitting the brass case apart. Inside was the smallest transmitter I'd ever seen. An ingenious thing it was, each tiny part nestled against the other, wasting no space. Shall I cut off the power? Jang Bu asked, pointing his chisel at the battery. No, not yet, said Hal. He thought for a moment. We're going to change course. Nothing too drastic. I don't want them getting suspicious. There's no moon tonight. 
We'll douse our running lights just in case they're closer than I think. Then we'll kill the transmitter. They'll lose our signal. After that, we resume our original course and part company for good. Go tell Dorje, please. After Jambu left the room, Hal looked distastefully at the transmitter and its ungainly tangle of antenna. It's an expensive little toy, and it makes me wonder what other clever gadgets they have. They've got a fast ship, too, if they followed us all the way from Paris. A high flyer, possibly. These fellows have money. I'd like to know where they got it. What about that old gentleman Rath was talking to in the Heliodrome, I suggested. A few days ago, I'd shown Hal the photograph of George Barton in the newspaper. Like Kate, he hadn't been convinced Rath would have any dealings with the Aruba Consortium. You said Nadira wasn't even sure it was the same man. No, but they've got the money to kit Rath out with fancy electrics and ships. Hal considered for a moment, then shook his head. I can't see the Consortium hiring pirates for a treasure hunt. They've got enough liquid gold in the ground to keep them happy. He got up to leave. What about Nadira? I said. You've got to unlock her. It's simply not fair, Kate insisted. Hal hesitated, then nodded. You two keep an eye on her then, he said. And Cruz, watch your back. Gypsies have fiery hearts in my experience, and they've got a healthy appetite for vengeance. Just remember, if she does kill you, I'll get your share of the loot. Hal left for the control card to oversee our change of course, and must have unlocked Nadira's cabin on the way, for a few minutes later, she walked into the lounge. Hello, said Kate cheerily, as if nothing had happened. Nadira walked over to the glass of port wine that Hal had poured for her earlier. She picked it up and downed it. We all watched in silence, Miss Simpkins peeping over the top of her novel. Nadira smacked her empty glass down into the counter, put her hands on her hips, and glowered at us. You scurvy dogs better watch your step around me or I'll send your guts with me pistol. For a few seconds, no one spoke. Then Nadira grinned, and Kate and I started laughing. How very vulgar, murmured Miss Simpkins, and went back to reading. Better get used to it, said Nadira. Now that I'm Spearglass's daughter, I'll be talking like this all the time. I expect a great deal of cussing, I said. Did he cuss much? No, not at all, really. She nodded. I understand I have you both to thank for my liberation. It was Kate, actually, I told her. She made a stirring speech. Hal was moved to tears. Nadira raised an eyebrow. He said he'd heave me overboard if he caught me sneaking about. He's just a bit tense, I said. She gave a sniff and sat down. I tried to superimpose spear glass upon her, but could see no similarities. The shape of the eyes, the mouth, the hands were all different. Still, now that I knew who her father was, his name whispered insistently through my mind, and I felt his presence heavily in the room. I'm sorry, I said, about your father. It's not your fault. He chose a very wicked life for himself. He certainly did, said Miss Simpkins, muffled behind her novel. I don't think he ever set out to be a murderer. I wanted to make Nadira feel better. He was a thief, and he killed people, if they got in his way. But he told me he didn't like doing it. And then he tried to kill you, Nadira said. Well, yes. Not much of a virtue, she remarked. Everyone has some good in them, Kate said kindly. Yes, certainly, I said. I thought about how Spearglass had held his son and told him stories. I would have liked to share this with her, but I did not want to cause her more pain. Likely, she did not know her father had other wives and other children. He wasn't a bad father, Nadira said after a moment. The little he was around. You said he taught you your numbers. And how to read. My mother's people couldn't, 
They didn't see the need. But he said it was important. He said there was a whole world in books. I'm grateful to him for that. After he left, did he ever come to visit you? Kate asked. No. Even if he'd wanted to, my mother's family would have lynched him. Partly I blame them for driving him away in the first place. They were not welcoming. Lynching does tend to discourage people, Kate said, and won a smile from Nadira. My mother said he had other wives, other children too, maybe. I kept quiet. So did Kate. Oh, he had a son, Miss Simpkins piped up. Uh, that boy, what was his name? You know, Kate. Kate gave her chaperone a withering stare. Theodore, she said quietly. For a moment, Nadira was silent. Where was this? she finally asked. In the Pacificus, on his island hideout, I told her. The boy's in an orphanage now. The Sky Guard wouldn't tell me where. How old was he? He'd be six now. She nodded, her face smooth and unreadable. I'd wager he's not the only half-sibling you have, said Miss Simpkins. Nadira ignored her. And the boy's mother? Spearglass said she died, I told her. A short life as a pirate's wife, murmured Miss Simpkins. She laughed at her own rhyme and then had a fit of coughing. Marjorie, said Kate, that cough of yours sounds wretched. Perhaps you should go to bed and sleep for a long, long time. I am rather tired, you know, this thin air. Go ahead, I promise not to wake you when I come in later. Very well, don't stay up too late. We all watched Miss Simpkins leave the room. That was nicely done, I said, when she was out of earshot. She's really quite a masterpiece, isn't she? Kate said. One day Madame Tussauds will make a wax dummy of her. In the Chamber of Horrors, I added. Kate laughed, and I smiled at her, realizing how much I'd missed her. She started to smile back, but then her eyes cooled, and this sudden connection between us crumbled like a cobweb bridge. We talked on a bit, the three of us, but I sensed we were ill at ease with one another. I felt the saga turn, and knew Hal was taking us on his trickster's course to throw off our pursuers. It wasn't long before we all started yawning and saying we should get some sleep. We made our way to our separate cabins, and for a few moments it was just Kate and me, alone in the corridor. I wanted to say something. She was being so chilly with me. Maybe she hadn't liked the way Nadira had sat with me at dinner. Or maybe, and my stomach gave a nasty squeeze, she really had seen us kissing in the crow's nest. I wanted to apologize. But I dared not mention it, for what if she hadn't seen, and I was just opening up a Pandora's box of trouble? Are you angry with me? I asked her. Why on earth would I be angry with you? She said, looking at me strangely. She seemed all surprised, so I assumed she couldn't know about the kiss. Kate would not lie. She was too terrifyingly straightforward. I should have been relieved, but only felt a keen disappointment. She was not angry with me. There could be only one explanation for her behavior. We stood in the corridor, facing each other. I wanted to ask her then and there if she preferred Hal to me, but I would not. I would not ask for reassurance, like a street urchin begging coins from the pretty rich lady. Oh, I said, I just thought you seemed a bit vexed with me. Not at all, she said. No vexation whatsoever? Not even a little bit? Not in the slightest. You're sure? She gave me the politest of smiles. I'm just tired. Good night. Good night, then. Inside my cabin, I washed my face in the basin. I could not remember a more ghastly conversation in my life. I beheld myself in the little mirror, wondering when I would see a man. All the lights went out suddenly, and I knew that Hal had thrown a cloak of darkness over the Sagarmatha. 
Now, under cover of night, he'd be smashing the transmitter to pieces. Our pursuers would lose the homing signal and be left with nothing but our phantom wake. As I settled under my blankets a few minutes later, I heard the drone of the ship's six powerful engines increase in pitch. I felt the saga bank swiftly as Hal took us back to our true course. I wished I knew my own true course. Next morning, Hal posted extra lookouts. He wanted no chance of the Hyperians slipping by undetected now that we were nearing our rendezvous mark. In the control car, Hal and Dorje scanned the skies directly ahead. Kami, who was walking again, though slowly, was stationed on the starboard side of the bridge. I was on the port. You could not have asked for more favorable weather. The sky was completely clear. From our altitude of 20,000 feet, you could see all the way to the white shores of Antarctica. It was a great relief to me that there was no sign of Raft's ship. Hal's ploy had obviously worked, and they were likely hundreds of miles off course by now. But there was no sign of the Hyperion either. As each minute ticked by, the tension in the control car coiled more tightly. With increasing regularity, Hal would seize the speaking tube and demand a report from Ang Jetta in the crow's nest. Nothing fore or aft, came the reply once more. Two hours after we'd overshot the mark, Hal turned to me and said, Cruz, those coordinates you gave us, you're sure of them? I wouldn't forget those numbers. You've been having trouble with your numbers at school, though, eh? That's different, I said indignantly. Then where the hell's our ship? Hal let his eyes rest on me longer than was pleasant, but I held his gaze, refusing to be rebuked. My calculations may be at fault, Dorje said quietly. Dorje, you've never been wrong in your life, said Hal. I want to check again. Hold our course for now. Dorje went back to the navigation room, and I heard the sound of his ingenious charts being taken out and unfurled on the table. Someone may have beat us to it, Jangu said from the wheel. Hal scoffed. There's only a couple ships in the world that could make these heights. Before we left, I checked up on the locations of all the other skybreakers. They're all tied up on long-haul jobs. They can't be seeking the Hyperion as well. I looked at Hal. I thought you said yours was the only ship that could work so high. A bit of an exaggeration. There are several. How many? Maybe a dozen. Probably more. But they don't have the coordinates, do they? Those sensationally accurate coordinates of yours. Hal kept us on watch long into the afternoon. When finally Dorje emerged from the chart room, we all turned expectantly. I didn't account properly for our proximity to Antarctica, he said. The cold air slides off the mountains there like an avalanche. No ship without power could cut those headwinds. The Hyperion will have changed her course. Bring us about east-northeast. We will find her yet. Up in the crow's nest, the cold numbed my feet and fingers as I peered into the vastness of the sky. It was half past three in the morning. With only the stars and a sliver of new moon, it would be near impossible to sight an unlit vessel. Luckily, Dorje had said we would not come across the Hyperion before midday, soonest. Which was why, no doubt, Hal had put me on this watch. As far as he was concerned, it was my fault we hadn't yet found the Hyperion. Every ship takes on the mood of its captain, and with a ship as cozy as the Sagramatha, Hal's ill humor was easy to detect. He had no tolerance for disappointment. We were circling the bottom of the world, and earlier in my watch, Hal had called up to report a storm festering over the Antarctic Ridge. I did not think it would bother us at this altitude, but suddenly I noticed whole swaths of stars disappearing along the horizon. The running lights on the Sagramatha's back reflected brightly against the mist that was quickly enveloping us. Crow's nest reporting, I said into the speaking tube. I know came Hal's voice. Just a little spume from the storm below. Should be through it before long. 
the Sagarmatha shuddered as she rode the turbulent air. Beyond the observation dome, the sky opened and closed as we sailed through the wispy cloud. Then, all at once, the cloud thickened, and there were no more snatches of star-speckled sky. The ship's lights flashed against the mist in time with my pulse. Crow's nest, I said. I'm blind up here. Can we climb above it? No need, came Hal's voice. We'll be through in a minute. I did not like this one bit. We picked up speed as Hal tried to drive us clear. I caught myself counting seconds. Hal was right. It did not take long. Soon the cloud began to thin once more. White cloud, black sky, white cloud. And then we plowed through the last of the high cirrus and were suddenly out in the open. Off to starboard, a huge wall of night hurtled toward us. I yanked the speaking tube to my mouth. Ship at three o'clock, I cried. Collision course! Through the tube I heard Hal barking orders to his crew, and then I could only stare in horror as the enormous vessel came at us broadside. She blotted out the sky as she came, looming above us, raven black and visible only for the ice glittering on her flanks. I saw her ribs, her flayed skin. We shed ballast so quickly I gave a shout. Our engines roared and we angled high, banking to port. I was tilted so far over I lost sight of the other ship for a moment. But then I heard an unearthly moan, like the woodwind section of Satan's orchestra, as she began passing beneath us. She struck. The impact threw me against the hatch. My face hit metal, and the sight was momentarily dashed from my eyes. The iron taste of blood filled my mouth. I rallied my senses. Peering out through the dome, I saw the ship, driven by the wind, careering diagonally through the sky. From the speaking tube, I heard the staccato exchange of voices in the control car. We've lost two and three on the port side. The ship must have sheared them off when she passed. Jongbu, go back and find out how bad the damage is. That was Hal. I want all available hands for repairs. How are the gas cells? We're tight. No leakage. Elevators and rudder, I heard Dorje ask. Seem fine. Thank God, said Hal. Get some lights on her and bring us about so we can follow her. Cruise. Here, I replied. Any damage up there? I don't think so. You all right? Fine. My tongue prodded for damage. I chipped a tooth and cut up the inside of my mouth. My skull was still intact, apart from a swelling behind my temple. Served me right. Served me right for not seeing the ship. What kind of lookout was I? A little more warning would have been useful, Hal said. I said nothing, feeling terrible. We were in cloud, I heard Dorje tell him in the control car. Hal sniffed. A feathering of Cirrus, nothing more. It was true, the cloud had been thinning, but the brief flashes of clear sky had not been enough for me to make out the ship, cloaked as it was in night. I was not sleepy. I had not let my eyes become bleary and unfocused. I'd been doing my best, but it was not enough. We saw nothing from the control car either, I heard Dorje remind Hal. Don't make excuses for him, Dorje, Hal said sharply. It was his watch, and we lost two engines on it. From the saga's bow, powerful spotlights blazed twin pathways through the night and quickly fixed on the airship before us. On her flank, I could make out the name, Hyperion. We hadn't found her. She'd found us.